Welcome to the Rustic Garden. This is my community plot series. I think I'm on episode five-ish. We finally got four days of sunshine. The heat's here, it's about 85 degrees. The rain seems to be gone, so everything is growing well, but that also means that diseases and insects come in. So today's really gonna be about prevention. The best way to stop an insect problem or a disease problem is to prevent it. And there's a couple things that you can do. I'm also giving away a bunch of tomatoes and peppers to people on the, on the community plot, so hopefully some people will be coming by. I'm gonna just do a quick walkthrough now, and then I'll do the video again and talk in more detail about the prevention. But one of the things you wanna do, for example, here's one of my tomato plants, is remove the bottom leaves, mulch, and that creates a disease splash barrier to keep spores from splashing up onto the bottom leaves. And that's how they usually get hold of your tomato plants and other vegetable plants. I'm gonna do a lot of weeding, a lot of um, pruning the bottoms of the tomato plants to let air circulation go. This is one of my broccoli plants. There are the white moths flying around. Those are the moths that lay the eggs that create the green cabbage loopers. And that's why you get all these holes in your kale plants, collards, broccolis, cauliflowers. Peas are doing well. More tomatoes, kale. All this um, growth is great, but now you have to start looking for bugs. You have to start looking for disease. And the best way to prevent stuff from getting out of hand is to catch it really, really early. And you can see right over there, right on cue, those white moths, they're looking to lay those green cabbage looper, looper eggs. Cabbages are doing well. Not many holes in them that because I've been taking care of them. And prevention really starts with you keeping sort of a log of when pests and disease show up in your garden. And you want to start preventative spraying two, three weeks before the disease arrives, before the pests arrive. This way you actually can stop them from getting hold. Let me get to cleaning up my community plots and then I'll talk to you about the different sprays. I'm going to talk to you about how do you use aspirin to bolster the uh, SAR response in your tomato plants. Um, some pretty cool things that I hope help you have a healthier garden. I'm cleaning up the beds, putting down mulch, weeding, doing all that kind of stuff. But I want to talk to you real quick about the sprays that I'm doing. The best way to prevent disease, prevent insect attacks, is to spray early. So that's what I do. I keep a log or a mental track of when fungus diseases show up in my garden or on my plants and when the insects show up. I'm gonna be using a baking soda spray, one tablespoon per gallon of water. That goes on most of my plants. If you've never used these uh, sprays before, always test spray. Anytime someone talks about a spray, test spray. Spray a couple of leaves, wait 48 hours. If there's no damage, go ahead and use them. So what I do is put a tablespoon of baking soda in a gallon of water, spray the leaves, and what that does is it changes the pH level of the leaf surface, and it makes it harder for different diseases and funguses to really attach themselves. On tomato plants, this only works for tomato plants, as I take one aspirin, uh, it's not coated, don't use coated aspirin, it'll mess up your sprayer. 325 milligrams of aspirin in one gallon of water, and you can mix the baking soda and aspirin together. What the aspirin does is it tricks the tomato into thinking it's being attacked by a fungus or disease because the salicylic acid in the aspirin mimics a natural hormone the plant releases when it's attacked by a fungus or disease. And it starts a, the, the uh, SAR response, which is systemic acquired resistance. So normally, if a tomato is being attacked by a fungus or disease, it releases a hormone. That hormone triggers the SAR response, and that really bolsters the, the, uh, <laughs> the defenses of the tomato to make it harder for the insects to do damage and make it harder for the disease to spread. By using the aspirin, you're fooling the tomato plant. It's starting this response and it's toughening up. So if the disease or insects do come, they're gonna to get to a tomato plant that's already bolstered and stronger. And it's, it truly actually really works. I use it um, just about every year um, through mid-June through July and look up aspirin and tomato and you'll be amazed at the great research that's on it. It only works for tomato plants, however. The other spray that I use, and I showed you that white moth that was flying around, is my neem oil. I know that that moth is everywhere. It shows up, it leaves, le yeah, lays the eggs of the green cabbage looper, chews holes into everything, so I like to spray with the neem oil ahead of time. You don't want to wait till you see holes. You don't want to wait till you see disease. Just keep a log, track when disease and fungus and insects show up in your garden, and spray um, preventively. You can start at two to four weeks before they show up, 
and that will really make a difference in you being able to get a great harvest out of your garden. So I'm going to take care of these sprays and I'll show you uh, the rest of the garden shortly. I mulched up some of my tomato beds and I just want to say again real quick, you can create a barrier from spores that are in your soil by putting down wood chips. Not only does it stop weeds from growing, helps with water retention, it also keeps spores from splashing out of the soil up onto your leaves. So I do like to mulch. Putting wood mulch on top of your soil is not going to bother the nitrogen or any kind of needs of the tomato plant or plants. And then I also prune out some of the leaves slowly as the plant grows and that creates a, a gap. So if soil did splash up, it's harder for it to reach the bottom leaves of the tomato and that's how spores get hold and that's how disease spreads upward on your tomato plant um, and other plants. I also put in some of my transplants. People ask me, why do you grow transplants when you can just put a seed in the ground? And you can do that if you have plenty of room. But when you're moving crops in and out of a space, let the tomatoes grow in a cup, seed start like I've shown you, and then you can just drop the tomatoes in. That's a uh, Bradley tomato. That will get tall. It's a semi-determinant, which means it kind of just grows slowly, but keeps going all season long. So when these dwarf tomatoes are done, the Bradley will take over that space and something else will go in there. I also added in some more colorful tomatoes. This was arugula, some mustard greens. I pulled them out. I'll leave those greens back there in a the corner over this week. But a Kentucky orange went in, a brandywine yellow went in. I can just drop the transplants in. They're actually buried about a third deep. So growing your transplants really gives you a jump in getting your indeterminates to size. Instead of having to put a seed in, you know, I have six or eight weeks of growth already going. I also put in a homestead variety right in there. That broccoli will either head or turn to seed in the next two weeks, and I will have tomatoes replacing that. And over on this side is my Cherokee purple. I want to show you uh, two more things. Right in here, I'm going to be dropping my cucumbers in, and that will finish up the video. But I wanted to show you how the wood chip project is going. I'm trying to grow um, a lot of my greens in wood chips. In these raised beds I just walked by, down at the bottom I put in wood chips. On the top I have soil, so they're going to be uh, slightly bothered, I think, by the wood chips pulling nitrogen out of the soil, but I think they're going to be okay. But this is my experiment. Right back there is a Brussels sprout and it's growing in mostly wood chips. There is some soil in there just to fill the gaps, but that whole container is wood chips. I've been feeding it with a liquid fertilizer. I'm going back and forth between a chemical fertilizer and Job's organic, but the goal is is to keep the nitrogen flowing in at a slow rate so it's there for the plant and not being used up by the wood chips, and that's what wood chips do. If you bury wood chips into your soil mix, as the wood decays, it competes for the nitrogen against your plant. And the plant looks pretty good. Bottom leaves are a little bit beat up, but we had ridiculous rain for like 18 out of 20 days. But it looks like it's greening up. It's competing. It's doing okay. This is also kale that I'm growing in wood chips. A little bit yellow. But I'm going to just keep working with the formulation of the fertilizer I'm giving it and see how that goes. The Asian red yard beans are back there. They're doing pretty well. My green beans have come up, so everything will be trellising nicely. The cabbages are doing really well. They're starting to head up. You can grow them in a container, obviously. That one's doing probably the best out of all of them. But things are going pretty good. So I'm going to show you um, the cucumbers, and that will be it for the video. So to finish up the video, I'm going to show you the cucumbers I planted. Peas are ready, and talk a little more about prevention. You can see the white butterfly right back there. And again, as soon as you see the insects coming to your garden, you want to start with your prevention. Another thing that I do is late, late uh, last night I put dust onto my plants. That will really kill off all the beetles and things that come in and cause problems. And then I wash it off in the morning. And you can see there's some residue, so I'll wash it off one more time. But I like to use the dust late at night, let it do its thing overnight, because all the chewing insects will come, crawl on the leaves, die off, and then I come and spray them off in the morning. Let me show you the cucumbers real quick. When it's 80 degree days, 60 degree nights, all your warm weather vegetables are really ready to go in. This is a bush champion that's in, an Armadian cucumber. I have a national pickling, that's a market moor. All the pots have the bottoms cut out. They'll grow right up this fence. When these peas come down, um, I think I'll either put in beans or maybe some more cucumbers. But they're flowering. You can see 
This variety is starting to mature. They're not quite ready. Another five to seven days. Over here I have full potted peas, edible pods too. So it's a nice plump pea with full size peas, but you just pick it off, eat the whole thing. Down here is a dwarf variety and you can see the peas are popping through. They should have been picked maybe three or four days ago, but that they're grown really just for the edible pod. But all the peas really will come through and be taken care of. There's another white moth. Will be uh, harvested and taken care of over the next seven to ten days. Took out some of my plants in there. Brussels sprouts are doing well. Cabbages are doing well. And you can see exactly what that white moth is doing. It's laying eggs on every cabbage, kale, and related plant in my garden. That's why you want to do prevention. And then a couple of cucumbers are getting put right into my new trellis. That's a straight eight. So I hope this really gives you an idea to think about prevention in your garden and what to start doing ahead of time before your pests and your disease arrive. If you start two to four weeks ahead of time, you'll save yourself a lot of headache and you'll get more produce to your table.